Well, uh, welcome uh, tonight to our first Wednesday lecture. I'd like to just preface my remarks. Uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, the library was notified of a very uh, large endowment uh, gift, trust gift to our, to our trust fund. And um, I'm just very uh, happy to, uh, on behalf of the library, to accept it for the town of Brattleboro. Um, it's, uh, uh, um, the gift is $1.2 million uh, from a Ronald James Reed who uh, lived in Brattleboro and Dummerston for his entire life. And uh, the story is so compelling, his personal story. Um, he was a uh, car mechanic, worked at the Haviland's uh, service station with his brother Frank until uh, 1980 when his brother uh, sold the, the, the gas station. And then he went to work at J.C. Penney's as a custodian. And that's where he worked until he finally retired. Um, he was a uh, self-made man and uh, came into the library. I like to think the library had a lot to do with making himself a self-made man because that's what libraries do. <laughs> you have access to information and uh, books and, and the world and a staff to assist you. So uh, it was uh, incredible, uh, it's been an incredible couple of days. And um, it, it's the kind of story that the news media loves. And um, we, it has appeared uh, so far in the New York Post, Christian Science Monitor, the Relevant Herald, Battle Reformer in the Commons, um, Kansas City Star, The Daily Beast, Slate, and The Guardian, and The Daily Mail. So it's made it overseas, and I've actually seen a posting in Ireland at one of the newspapers in Ireland. So it's been, it's, it's quite amazing. So um, I'm just very, uh, very happy for that. So anyway, uh, tonight uh, we have our uh, February uh, first Wednesday uh, talk, and uh, the sponsors for uh, the series um, are local community businesses and organizations such as Downs Rackland Martin, Brattleboro Savings and Loan, Vermont Country Store, New Chapter Inc., the Wyndham World Affairs Council, and this year uh, for the March uh, uh, series, the local funder will be the Brattleboro Camera Club. And of course, the Vermont Department of Libraries is the state-wide uh, uh, sponsor. And the overall sponsor is the Vermont Humanities Council. They're the ones who put these on in, in eight other locations in the state. So uh, we still have a brochure that lists all of the uh, events for the next uh, several months. So pick one of those up uh, when you leave. Also, we have a feedback form for tonight. Uh, please uh, uh, tell us what you would like to see in uh, coming uh, talks. We'll be planning. Uh, the 2015, 2016 season soon. And um, just uh, uh, hope you enjoy tonight's talk. Uh, so tonight I'm very uh, pleased to uh, welcome uh, Suzanne uh, Claxton. She came to us all the way from Burlington and she's driving back up tonight. I'm glad it's not uh, Monday when we had the big storm. So <laughs> She is an adjunct professor of philosophy at Green Mount Mountain College where she teaches courses on the Greeks, Plato and Socrates. And uh, she's all, she told me tonight she also has uh, begun a curriculum there on uh, Shakti Kriyatik's uh, tribal dance. And I'm sure you'll talk a little bit more about that uh, <laughs> since I murdered the, uh, <laughs> the pronunciation, I'm sure. Um, she studied uh, Martin Heidegger and Plato at the University of New Mexico, where she is currently uh, obtaining a PhD. So please welcome uh, Suzanne Clark. Thank you, Jeff. Hi. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I'm not accustomed to using a microphone when I lecture. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I came to Vermont in uh, August of 2008 and I've been teaching at Green Mountain College as a philosophy professor this entire time. But I've been teaching philosophy for, this is my 15th year to teach. Um, I'll be defending my dissertation on March the uh, 5th actually, so I'm um, expecting that to be successful. I've been in my doctoral program for nine years, and uh, prior to that I have an MA in philosophy and a BA in letters, and uh, studied uh, a lot of Judaic studies. I have a minor in that. Languages are Hebrew, uh, ancient Greek, and Latin for the purposes of translating texts. Um, hard pressed to find anyone who wants to speak Latin with you. <laughs> so, but um, 
Yeah, um, so uh, this will be my third lecture for the Vermont Humanities Council, which I enjoy doing this very much. Obviously my first time in Brattleboro to do this, but um, came up with the title just because that's a, a nice broad title in an area that I'm very familiar with. And, um, you know, and then I was like, okay, what exactly will I talk to you about? It's, uh, to me, it's like, a, you know, trying to decide what's my point going to be is kind of like deciding where the point is on a circle. There's an infinite number of points in a circle, <laughs> right? If this was a square, it'd be different. We'd have like four <laughs> to choose from. Um, so um, the thesis kind of uh, where I wanted the main point I'm going to try to get across to you is a, a concept that's very um, important in continental philosophy, whether you know what that means or not, it's not really that important. It's a certain area of philosophy that deals greatly with the ancients um, and sort of revisiting and looking at these texts, pre-Socratics, you know, the Platonic dialogues and obviously the works of Aristotle with this idea that when we revisit these ancient texts, um, we always do so with an openness to a new understanding of them, given that our understanding as a, as a culture, as a consciousness, over time changes. So the main idea is summed up in the word polysemy, so polysemic, the many meanings. And, you know, I don't know who has or has not read The Republic or how long ago that was. And um, in my own experience now in school for a really long time, 20 something years, um, college level teaching, etc. Each time I reread a text for the purpose of my own studies or because I'm going to teach it to students, I have experiences of finding new meaning there if I, indeed I am open to finding new meaning. And so I titled this talk, um, Rethinking Plato's Utopian Ideal. And thought we would just pull out some of those central notions and um, reevaluate them, if you will, or consider them under their adequacy for us in this point in human history, um, where definitely things are vastly different than they were 2,500 years ago. And in other ways, though, we could say they're exactly the same. So that's sort of uh, the thesis, that we can always revisit the texts, especially the, these sort of classic ones, to find new meanings. Um, that idea in and of itself is a relatively new idea in philosophy. If, if you're a student of philosophy and you understand the history of philosophy and the, the era in which there was the establishment of the canon and where there was a particular interpretation set forth for any given philosopher and that was the interpretation. Um, in the last three decades especially, um, there's this emphasis on um, obviously revisiting the canon because we need to keep those meanings fresh to us, but being open to the idea that perhaps that person in 1572 who really thought they knew what Plato meant might have had their own biases or blindnesses or prejudices which limited their way of understanding Plato. Um, so the basic idea in the Republic um, is that there's a dialogue happening in which the main development is an analogy between the state, you know, the community, and the individual human soul. And, you know, Plato is the mouthpiece for his teacher Socrates who never wrote anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why Plato likes to put all of his great ideas uh, as if they were coming from Socrates. And so, just to quickly go through that in case anyone's forgotten or doesn't know, um, the analogy sets forth that in the individual human being, the individual soul or psyche of a person, there's three elements. There's your capacity to reason, your, which is where you have your logos, and then there is your will or your thymotic element, um, that part of you that will um, back up the, the reason or not. <laughs> and then of course there's that aspect of your soul that's the appetitive, the appetites the desires, the drives, which is neither will nor reason. And what, Pl what Plato does in the dialogue is he tries to show that if you want to have a thriving, flourishing, utopian type community, 
that you're going to go through a similar process to create that community as you would go through to create an ideal individual person. And so he sets forth this analogy, and he goes back and forth between the two all through the dialogue of the Republic. Um, reason, he likens to the philosopher kings. And he believes that in a society in which we are hoping to establish um, things like egalitarianism and equality before the law and you know, equal opportunities for education and such, that you, you can't just have anybody in charge. The, the, the people you need to have sort of in charge are what he calls the philosopher kings, right? So people with a certain type of soul. And again, don't get too caught up in the term soul. That's just the translation of the word psyche in Greek. Um, but inner world, inner life, right? Your inner life is your psyche. And then, of course, in the individual person, you have the, your will, your thymotic element. And he likens that in a state or a city or a country or a community to what we might think of as our military element or our police force, our enforcement element, right? That group of people that is going to make sure that the rule of the rulers gets carried out. And in your individual soul, your will is intended to serve reason. And then, of course, there's the, the common people or the craftsman people, as he calls them in the, in the state or society, um, who are obviously not at that, held to that highest level of standard as the rulers are, nor are they inclined to be enforcers of rules. And he likens that to your appetites and your desires. And so for him, to have um, an ideal society, you have to have this sort of reciprocal relationship between every individual member of society and the society. In other words, you can't possibly want to have a good community that's full of bad members. That's irrational. You can't achieve it. You can't have a good society, a good community, if, if, it's, if all of the members of it are bad, immoral, vicious, whatever word you like. All right, I tend to speak with Aristotelian terminology, so I talk about vice and viciousness. And he, and he says, but likewise, you can't possibly expect to create a lot of good individuals if the society isn't one that helps promote, cultivate, and encourage the virtuous traits that, that we're speaking of that would belong to individuals in a good society. And so there's this constant going back and forth between the individual person and the state in this analogy, but he's putting forth the idea of the reciprocal relationship between the person and their community. So right there we could you know, stop and talk about some, some various things there. Um, three sort of elements of this is this, the formation of a state or a community. So we could just talk about the city of Brattleboro, maybe. You, know, you could talk about your little local community, whatever level we're at. There's state formation. There's the psyche cultivation of the individual. And then there's education. And being somebody who's in higher education and academia my entire life, um, there's a lot of things going on in education over the last many decades, if not longer, that cause a lot of people to you know, feel they need to like, you know, learn about it and understand things better. For Plato and Socrates, as he attributes to him, what education is in, in its core, in its nature, its essence, is the turning of the soul of the individual person. And so I liked it when Jerry was introducing and he was talking about how he hoped that uh, the man that made this nice endowment uh, utilized the library for his self-creation. You know how he referenced that? The self-made man uses the library. And, and so the library is, is an example of this idea. We, education is not merely, oh, I go and I enrolled in a class, you know, and I have received some credits. To the ancient thinkers and the people who, you know, in the Hellenic world founded the very notion of the university as we have it today, what education really is when it happens, when it occurs, is the fundamental altering of that individual's soul. When you truly learn, you are changed. So this is a far <laughs> cry from memorization of mere facts and figures or the regurgitation of data. Um, and, and of course, for Plato, 
with this idea of what does it take to create this good society, this good community? Moreover, how is this related to the creation of good individuals? Education is sort of the, the, the central component. It's the, it's the foundational piece. It's the singular building block for this to occur. Um, and so when we kind of take those ideas and instead of thinking about them merely in the context in which they're spelled out in the Republic, you know, I don't know, again, who has read it recently and remembers, oh, what, you know, the various things we have to do where we eliminate certain kinds of music and we eliminate certain kinds of poetry because it's too provocative. Um, rather, we can revisit these ideas and think about them as we might take them conceptually and apply them to our contemporary existence. Okay, so again, like the reference to the library as a place of learning where you can make yourself, alter yourself, change yourself. Um, our access to, to information now with smartphones and, and the internet and things like that. Central though to the idea of the, the alteration of a soul and how education can bring that about is this concept of the Socratic method, which you, again, may or may not remember what this is about. The Socratic method is fundamentally the idea of stimulating critical thought and illuminating ideas. And so those two pieces, and that form the basis of all philosophy, but this idea that you wanna stimulate people to evaluate the beliefs and ideas that are held in a society as well as in their own minds, in a critical manner. That is to really take that idea or that belief or that um, goal and examine it from as many points of view as possible. And then perhaps introduce a new idea, a different idea, and then evaluate those two things side by side. And this forms a process of learning. Um, in Hegelian dialectic, the easiest way to put it is you have a thesis and you have an antithesis. All right, we can pick something simple. We all understand capital punishment being against capital punishment. All right, thesis antithesis. To encourage critical thought and the illumination of new ideas involves that both of those things be evaluated in a sort of a systematic way that's critical, that is with you know, analytic reflection and in the process of doing so, perhaps introducing, if, if, if it's there to, to be had, a new or different alternative, a new idea to those things. So much of our modern world, and this is for you know, people that take these ancient things and they try to say, well, how does this apply to, to today? So much of what goes on now is considered strictly binary thinking. Uh, you know, a lot of people, we talk about how they're just black and white thinkers, right? There's right and there's wrong, okay? There's the blue and the red, right? You're either for us or against us in this binary kind of approach. At this point in the history of philosophy, there's a, a great contingency of philosophers who feel like this tendency toward binary thinking, albeit helpful in the early stages of the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment era, and still helpful in some practical regards, has actually boxed us in in terms of our consciousness, so that we are not even engaging in the kind of thought that the ancients were trying to promote. That is, we approach every issue as maybe perhaps, you know, a Democratic or a Republican, one, or, you know, pick whatever binary you wish. Um, and of course, that is a limiting approach to anything you want to talk about. So this notion of, of stimulating critical thinking and illuminating ideas and a key component of it, which I think, again, you know, I always try to impress this upon whoever I'm talking to, whether it's just students at the school or, or outside of a classroom, is that word idea. <laughs> and I know on the one hand it's so simple and we're, we use it all the time and we probably all have lots of ideas and we like ideas. You wouldn't be here if you didn't like ideas. Um, we like to think about ideas. But the thing that Plato and then later Aristotle impresses upon us over and over and over is that by its very nature, an idea is something that is transcendent of human beings. So for Plato, that's why he has the realm of the forms, okay? 
We're not going to sit around here today and, and you know talk about the realm of the forms in that sort of canonical way, where oh the form of the chair is out there and such. But if we just think about the notion that ideas are not things, they're not objects. We can't go out and dig them up. Happiness. We can't go dig up happiness. We can't plant happiness in the garden. Is everybody following me on that? These are these are concepts or abstract ideas. And so when you approach these ancient thinkers with this sort of open-mindedness to the role and place and purpose of ideas in the unfoldment of humanity and human being, community, and individual, we can start to see that things like the Socratic method, education, we don't need to argue about for how long, but it seems to have definitely gone off the track in that so many people don't even realize the very nature or essence of an idea. They take them for granted. So like right now, if I passed out little pieces of paper and I said, okay, everybody in the room in one sentence, did, tell me what is freedom? It could be that every single person writes something different. And it's not necessarily the case that anyone would be wrong because it's an idea. Freedom is an idea. Happiness is an idea. Peace, love, and of course one of the big ideas in Plato's Republic is justice. And you know, if there's one idea that seems to pervade all of American culture at this point where everyone does claim to have to care about it, it is justice. All right? And so that's why he takes great pains, I think, in in discussing justice. And of course, like I said, at the canonical approach to understanding what Plato thinks about justice, in some ways we could say it completely misses the mark on what he was trying to get us to understand about justice. It, this is not the same as saying that justice is something relative or, sub, or merely subjective, okay? It's not like any old definition of justice will do. Because for the ancient thinkers and for a lot of contemporary philosophers, especially in the continental field who study ancient thought, ideas have a transcendental reality all their own by nature of being an idea. It's, in other words, it's not just something we made up, right? You couldn't just string some letters together and suddenly go, oh, look, I have a whole new idea. Okay? The ideas have a transcendental reality. And it's up to human beings as finite, limited creatures who possess reason to spend time sort of researching, contemplating, thinking about, considering certain important concepts such as justice. Um, I know my own experience, I feel like ideas such as justice, peace, freedom, love, happiness, they are too often reduced down to the justification for pursuing some very particularized and practical agenda. Okay, where people will be like, well, in the name of justice, we want to pass this certain bill, right? But what you won't hear in any of that rhetoric is a discussion of justice itself. Like, what does that person mean by the term? And so this was one of Plato's, or rather Socrates, as he puts, the, puts it onto him, this is one of his sticking points in sort of developing this Socratic method. I'm assuming everybody kind of remembers a little bit about the story of Socrates as we hear it through Plato. You know, he was a wrestler, and he wasn't that much, he wasn't a very attractive man. You know, he had the big cauliflower ear, he had had his nose broken a lot. Um, something happens to him later in life, maybe you'd call it an awakening or he had an epiphany or something, and he suddenly becomes very much interested in the contemplation of ideas and the discussion of ideas. And um, he just begins to do that, you know, out in the market square on the street. And that's where he was a teacher, he never had a classroom. And he begins to engage powerful people in discussions of these concepts and ideas, such as justice piety, freedom. And through the dialectic or the, this Socratic method, he's able to question people and get their answer and question them further to help bring out or show contradictions 
that they hold regarding those ideas. And of course, I assume everybody here realizes that even when you're thinking for yourself or you're discussing something with someone, anytime you run up against a contradiction, that calls out for further thinking on the matter. Because a contradiction is a contradiction as we understand reason. It cannot be raining and not raining at the same time. And so this sort of looking for the contradictions um, is part of that process of turning the soul in education. Okay, as growing as a person, however, even if you're just up there reading books on your own for 30 years, right? This is the process that would be occurring if indeed your soul is being turned in, the, in this pursuit of knowledge and understanding. And so with Socrates, if you rec recollect what happened, obviously it's in the Apology and the Euthyphro and these other dialogues, um, he basically angered the wrong person, uh, Euthyphro, an attorney who was powerful, who was going to uh, try his own father for impiety. And Socrates is like, wow, you know, you're willing to put your own father on trial in a, a charge that carries the punishment of death even. And Euthyphro was like, well, of course I am. I'm a lover of justice. I'm, a commi I'm committed to justice. You know, and then Socrates is like, yeah, of course you are. Well, let's talk about this charge of impiety. You know, impiety is that serious. He says, so tell me, Euthyphro, um, regarding being pious and, and doing, you know, right and, and carrying out the good, um, is it the case that the gods decide what's right and wrong or are the gods, as gods, simply privy to that knowledge? And that was the question that ends up getting him killed, because Euthyphro could not answer the question. Because it's a fundamental metaphysical question. It's the question of what is really the highest transcendental reality, what we call gods, deities, who just pick and choose what they want to tell us to do arbitrarily? Or in fact, is there something like justice is there a transcendental reality that carries weight that then any being, God or mortal, can tap into and understand and would then know, yes, this action is right and this action is wrong. But of course, Euthyphro was just flustered and became angry at Socrates and basically went and got all his high-powered lawyer friends and they charged him with impiety. He went on trial and they put him to death for that. He accepted it happily, but, and you can read, you know, all the things he has to say about that in the Apology. Even in the Apology, though, in the canonical understanding of philosophy, I feel like, not just me, but this sort of trend that's happening in the last 30 years, they've come to see that they feel like some of the most important ideas of Plato are missed. Because what Plato is trying to emphasize when he's telling you these, this terribly sad and tragic story about his most beloved teacher, Socrates, that the thing he's really trying to impress upon the reader and all, for all the people thereafter, here we are 2,500 years later, is not you know, whether as a society we have laws about piety, but rather as a society who does create laws and seeks to enforce them and individuals who comes up with ideas and codes of conduct in our own mind, whether we are not even thinking about ideas in the proper manner and say, holding a public discussion, you know, and discussing the metaphysical reality of the nature of justice, you know, or freedom, or whatever our current, you know, idea of concern may be. Um, one example that, that I like to give at, in terms of speaking about justice, thinking about justice, and again, um, you can find a lot of these if you engage in a lot of, you know, media, and uh, you watch debates and things, but um, has to do with the issue of, of capital punishment. Um, I, I'm neither for nor against for the purpose of anything, but you know, one of sort of the common men mentalities with that is that someone who's for it, you know, is in favor of it, might make the argument, well, we can't have a system of justice and a legal system where we're, we would risk letting go a guilty person. Most of us can kind of think of what that means and we're like, okay, yeah, none of us really wants guilty people to get away. However, what Plato points out about that is 
Well, but are you willing to have a system where you risk punishing an innocent person? And with the death penalty specifically, killing them, therefore you can't revoke that punishment. You can't get it back. And why this is relevant to Plato is because there's a contradiction there. If you're saying that you're committed to the ideal of justice, but yet you're willing to risk killing an innocent person in your pursuit of justice, you've already turned away from justice. Hopefully that, that's making sense there. And I think for us as individuals, we kind of encounter these things in our lives where we have to make choices, what we want to do about something and whether we want to act a certain way. And we have to evaluate whether we're willing to risk, you know, whether if it seemed mildly insulting someone, you know, whether we're willing to do that just in case, you know, something might be true, or whether we feel like, no, I don't want to risk harming an innocent in my pursuit of doing what's right. And, and of course, for Plato, this is tremendous because he says this is this defining um, characteristic in terms of individual souls regarding justice. Those who are willing to harm the innocent in the pursuit of justice are not really committed to justice. They fundamentally do not understand justice or they wouldn't be willing to do that. And so, in, like I said, in the dialogues, uh, there's a lot of these different concepts and ideas that get evaluated in this way. Um, like, but canonically, through the history of philosophy, a lot of that gets sort of pushed aside in favor of focusing on certain fundamental things, all of which are still potentially relevant. Um, this emphasis, though, on the logical nature of things and this sort of evaluating ideas in terms of looking for contradiction is crucial to the evolution of the individual soul for, for Plato, for all ancient thinkers. And again, I'm a big fan of Aristotle. I love Plato for the sheer joy of reading him. I find Aristotle far more tedious, but Aristotle is actually a lot more in depth. Right? He really gets to the details. And, and so this idea that we would make reason as an individual person our ruler subsuming all of our desires, all of our selfish inclinations and appetites under the rule of reason makes sense when you think about it in this larger context of the evaluation of ideas. I mean, because we can all, you know, if we're not sure if this animal, is this a cow or is this a, you know, an antelope, we can all go and gather information and make, you know, good judgments on simple things like that, factual kind of things, matters of fact. Right? If you don't know the answer, you can probably find somebody that knows the answer. But when it comes to ideas and ideals, there's not like, oh yeah, you know, uh, Dr. You know, Dr. Sherman down the road, <laughs> he's an expert. <laughs> he's the specialist with ideas. There is no such person because ideas are not things. They're these transcendental realities. The only access to which you have is by means of thinking. And obviously thinking is often best done in uh, communication with others. So in like a dialogue or a discussion. You know, so things like we do in our community where we have community meetings, right? And you try to allow people to have time to speak and you, you know, can have back and forth. And so that's crucial to employ reason in this proper way. Moreover, when you go back to this idea of the soul, being an, uh, analogized with the state and having things in proper order, bringing about something resembling a utopia. You could also think that on the individual level, what we mean is like uh, this sort of ultimate sort of contentment as a human being, to really feel comfortable with the choices that you make at the end of a given day. Not because you stop and refuse to think about those things anymore or dulled your mind with hours of television or you know too many glasses of sherry or whatever but that you engage in this process this process of critical reflection and with this aim toward finding contradictions and if indeed you find them then you look to eliminate them by eliminating a different alternative okay and so again back to this sort of the curse of modernity, if you will, this binary way of approaching everything. You're either for us or against us kind of thing, right? You're either right or you're wrong. 
you know, and sort of eschewing that, pushing that aside. Because even Plato, as he attributes to Socrates, it, it was never the case where he said, oh, we're going to figure it all out right here and now. You know, just give me a chance, put me in charge. His understanding was because these ideas and ideals are transcendental, there's an element of infinity to them. And I mean that in the literal way, in the finite. They're not finite, okay? A concept like freedom, and I'm sure everyone can think about this and grasp this, the very concept of freedom itself will alter and change over the course of your individual life. So most assuredly, it will alter and change over the course of the life of a community, however old Brattleboro is, for instance, <laughs> or the, the span of the United States, right? Or the span of Europe, or the history of all humanity. And so there has to be this constant revisiting, rethinking, this openness to the polysemy of meaning so that we can you know, stay uh, motivated and inspired to hold our ideas and our ideals in a way that can bring about anything even remotely resembling a utopia, a utopia or a, a happy life, a flourishing life, a contented heart, all right? And, and so my own, um, having been especially looking at Plato's Republic for nine years rather intensely, um, and I feel very blessed to get to teach this stuff. I love teaching. And I love having to read the same thing over and over for this purpose. I, more and more, I feel like every semester and every year I teach, this becomes clearer and clearer and clearer, not just to me, but also in my ability to convey it. Um, and then, you know, watching the way things change over time. And I don't just mean things like things, but I mean ideas and ideals. You know, how we as a country or a society or community conceive of freedom, how we conceive of happiness. You know, lots of people like to talk about the 80s. And they're like, yeah, that was the me generation, right? That's when everybody became selfish and, and greedy. And so you might think of freedom and happiness in the 80s was a kind of a different concept than what we might think of freedom and happiness now. All right? And so this understanding of the nature of, of ideas and ideals, having this transcendental reality that is in its own nature, in essence, infinite, beyond us, not that it's not worth our effort, what I mean when I say it's infinite and we're finite, again, is related to the very ancient conception of truth. Um, the word in the Greek is aletheia. It literally means unforgetting or unconcealing, based on the river Lethe, that when you die, you go through that river and you forget everything that happened in your life. And then your soul goes and gets to be reborn again. That's their little metaphysics. But their understanding of truth as aletheia is that what truth really is, is this thing that is infinite. And, you know, I get to have however many years on this earth. Hopefully I get to have, you know, at least 80 or something. What I'm able to uncover, discover, recover as truth is truth, but by no means is it the whole of truth. And just as we all, I think, have probably experienced over and over in our lives, Every year you live, every day you live, you might feel you uncover another part of truth, that something else is further revealed to you. You gain new insight or new understanding or new perspective or new point of view. Life is not merely a changing of our minds in the sense of going from one binary option to another, right? The sort of the fullest, most rich lives are those ones that sort of grow like a sphere, enlarging. All right, so go back to like the notion of points on a circle, now make it three-dimensional. How many potential points on a sphere, All right? And so it's not like you're gonna wake up on your uh, 60th birthday, I'm all done now, I know it all, I figured it all out, I've got the whole of truth in my possession, I understand the concept of love, happiness, freedom, and justice <coughs> completely. I mean, somebody might do that, but they should probably like, you know, seek treatment, go to some you know, group meetings and get some perspective or something like that. Um, so yeah, the, the, the sort of central place and purpose of ideas and ideals and the way we should understand them um, is incredibly important to, to Plato. And of course, like I said, this isn't just you know some 
overstimulated intellectual guy up in a you know ivory tower collecting his you know money from his tenure or something you know this for, for Plato as best we can understand this is very practical this is about living your day-to-day -day existence and being in community with other people and what kind of community are you going to have and what's going to shape your community right what are the guiding ideals you know, I, I can't, nothing's coming to me right now. That's un unbelievable. You have tons of ideas, but you know, anything is like that. You see, like you'll see a building in a, a town you've never been in. You don't even know what the building is, but maybe on the top, you see the words integrity, community, and justice. <laughs> All, you know, and you're like, those are lovely words, but what exactly do you mean? Like, what are we talking about? You know, justice for just some people, <laughs> the ones who voted for the right people, or you know, it, so I think everybody understands what I'm talking about. Um, that use of words in a way that we could construe as propaganda, unfortunately, was also something you know perfected in that ancient world, that same ancient world that gave rise to Socrates and Plato, was the school of the of sophistry which is basically come learn how to manipulate people through propaganda and slogans. And of course, you know, people interested in contemporary social political philosophy, you know, that's a big criticism of what goes on in our contemporary world. That there is an abuse of language and an abuse of concepts and ideas. And that because, unfortunately, education has devolved in certain ways, or maybe people don't utilize their library enough, <laughs> they are like lambs led to a slaughter. You know, I like to call them sheeple. <laughs> sheeple. You know, they're docile, okay? You just gotta herd them along. Um, so yeah, so, you know, concepts and ideas, ideals, their place and purpose. Um, I'm getting close to running out. But, um, Again, one last thing to return to that analogy between the, the state or the community and the individual person. Um, I find it incredibly helpful because a lot of people, even if they haven't studied Plato, if you just try to talk to them about, you know, having self-awareness enough to distinguish between what is my reason, what is my will, and what is my appetite, um, I, I think can be a little difficult until you've given it some thought and spent some time with that to try to make that discernment. One of the mistakes, and this is in a different dialogue where he references this, is this idea that the will has a life of its own. And what Plato wants to emphasize is that the will does not have a life of its own. The will can do nothing on its own. The will is always the servant of either reason or appetite. And recognizing that for Plato or you know people interested, it's Aristotle, ancients, um, is crucial. Because I know just like being around kids, like you know, you'll hear somebody say, well, you know, he's hard headed, he's strong willed. Trying to excuse something based on the idea that someone has willfulness, as if the will itself is you know, got a motive to it. But Plato makes very clear in a number of examples that the will by itself can do nothing. It has to be directed by either the appetites or reason. And so that's very illuminating in terms of when we look at choices we have to make, whether as an individual or as a society. You know, say you're going to go vote, vote on some issues or whatever. When you have the capacity and willingness to engage in a self-analysis where you can discern the difference between what reason says and what your own sort of selfish appetite, desire, or inclination might be. Which makes me want to come back just to hear about Agamemnon and revenge, just because, you know, Clytemnestra and all of that's such great, I love the Oristia, the Aeschylus. That's, all of those uh, Greek tragedies, for example, are just excellent places to think about these concepts because that's what they're illustrating. Again, in the ancient world, theater was not entertainment. It was education. That's why you were required to go. Nobody got to stay at home. Everybody had to go. And it wasn't for entertainment. 
It was the shaping of your soul through the illustration of concepts and ideas. And so, um, yeah, that might be a good place to kind of, to kind of wrap things up. Um, I'm gonna take questions, and I think Jerry wants to have a um, microphone. Yeah. Thank you for a great uh, and, and stimulating talk. I really appreciated it. Um, you mentioned uh, binary uh, oppositions and, and how uh, 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 they're disagreeable in a way. Uh, <coughs> contradiction is a binary. Absolutely. I wonder if uh, there aren't thinkers uh, in, the la in the last little while that overcome uh, uh, the, the constraints of a binary contradiction and think more broadly. That's an excellent question, and I'm so pleased you asked it. In fact, one of the philosophers uh, that I use a great deal in, in my dissertation, which I'm about to defend, is an Italian philosopher by the name of Giorgio Agamben. And he has a book, um, Homo Sacer is the name of the book. And um, he does indeed attempt to show that even in a binary, there is a third position, if you will, always present. And it is that third position from which one is even able to make the distinction between the binaries. He approaches explaining his point of view through the use of the ancient person known as a homo sacer. I don't know if you're familiar with the, you know, the way they carried out law and stuff in the ancient world. There's actually something similar in, in Judaism when you are exiled in a certain way. Um, the term wargus, I don't know if you've ever heard that term, this is also a person that is put out. And what Agamben argues is that, so let's just take the binary, if you will, of the polis, right, the city, what we can think of as the juridical realm, and then the divine realm. What he says is that those two realms can't even be created or conceived, those two binaries, until that third zone is created, and he calls it a zone of indistinction. And his example of it is the person, the homo sacer, that's the literal name for it in the ancient world. This is a person who cannot be murdered because they no longer are granted personhood, but nor can they be executed by law because they do not have personhood. Therefore, they get cast out. Back then, you remember how you could exile people and actually just kind of kick them out of the city and send them on their way. This person ends up being someone who has no political standing, but nor do they have standing in the divine world either. And so his argument is that all binaries, essentially, are created by the positing of a third zone, if you will, depending on what we're talking about, from which we can make the distinction. And so just like in our world, you know how people will say, well, you've got your personal life and your public life, right? That's a common one we use. For a Gomben, there has to be a third zone from which we make that distinction. But the very nature of that third alternative or zone is that it is exiled or ignored. A good example I might give for this, think about this for just a second, because for him this is all related to power and power structure, and all binaries carry power. Just like if someone says to you, well, are you red or blue? And in that moment, you're, you're frozen into having to make a choice, which way am I going to identify, right? A good example is that when binaries are created, there's a power built in to, to that. And one example that I actually came up with in the course of trying to explain these things in a written way in my dissertation, think about little kids on a playground, and you know the silent treatment that a child will give another child. So imagine there's a group of five children, or however many, and they're playing, and suddenly one child decides on their own that they are going to give this other child the silent treatment. They are actually treating that child when they give them the silent treatment as a homo sacer, that is, as this third zone that is neither in nor out. You're neither in nor out. You do not exist when you, when you ignore that child. You sort of put them in that position. 
And so for Egon, then, just to answer your original question, there is always some third. It could potentially be fourth or fifth, even, but there's definitely a third. In fact, when you reference contradiction itself being a binary in logic, you know, in, in that sort of higher level analysis of logic, that is understood to be the case. That you can't even make that x not x except from this third position. So, so hopefully that, that served to answer your question a little bit. Somebody up here I thought was going to ask something. He's going to. Um, I'm curious what. Uh, two things. One is, how did the philosopher kings know uh, how to access transcendent forms, like, say, of justice, mm -hmm. and, and then apply it? Okay. Uh, you know, how, how did they... Well, the best we can tell, like, from reading the dialogues, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a special... There's not like a special training you go through. It really is just through what I was referring to as the Socratic method. Um, any given group or society or community, or say you have a book club even, you know, you could posit that at, you know, as a book club, you're going to have a couple of key ideals that, that run your book club. Um, the idea would be just to posit the ideal as meaningful to you and then engage in a Socratic method, obviously with another person or multiple people where you have a, a discussion, sort of a back and forth Q&A, in order to uncover the nature of that ideal. It's almost by a process of elimination. In fact, this current, what we call the scientific method, and it comes from the Socratic, the Socratic method. It's the elimination of hypotheses when you find them to carry too much contradiction. And so just like if we would you know, spend hours and hours talking about justice, it's not like any of us had to have special training, um, you know, but you ask a valid question insofar as you implied a little bit, like, well, you know, maybe how would we even know which people <laughs> are the ones who should be doing this, right? And that would be probably a whole series of lectures in order to answer. But hopefully that makes sense to you all. Any, I, my assumption, because I'm a teacher, is everybody can do this. Every thinking being can engage in the Socratic method and uncover the nature of a given ideal, whatever ideal you're committed to. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I'm just curious. Uh, I read somewhere, and perhaps maybe Jerry mentioned this at the beginning, I don't remember, but you apparently have an interest not only in Plato, but in uh, Heidegger and Nietzsche. And I'd be interested if you see parallels between Heidegger and Plato. I know you mentioned Alethea in your discussion. Mm -hmm. That would be an obvious place, presumably. Yeah. But I'm thinking maybe, uh, I don't know, did Heidegger also think of the idea as a transcendent entity, and if so, or any, yes. any parallels that you might have observed, I'd be Yes, yeah, the answer is yes. In fact, Heidegger is one of my uh, figures that I specialize in. My areas, which I meant to mention, are ancient philosophy, obviously Plato, Pre-Socratics, Aristotle, but also all the existentialists. So Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Sartre. Um, but absolutely, Heidegger was a lover of the ancients. He himself was very adept at reading Greek, and he was enamored of, of Plato and Aristotle. And um, to your point about do, do I think that Heidegger might have I also understood this transcendent, absolutely, yes. Um, especially if you read any of his, well, Being in Time, it's in there, but that's a big old book to try to get through. But if you even read um, his uh, much smaller volume on Herdland's poetry, because Heidegger, like the ancients, felt that you can have the most powerful impact on people through art and myth. So just like I was saying, in the ancient world, everybody went to theater and you watched the, the tragedies played out. For Heidegger, it's the same thing. Yes, I can stand up here and lecture in sort of an orderly manner, logical all day, but I'm probably going to impact you the most if maybe I had thrown in um, a poem and some interpretive dance or something like that, where you, there's a sense, in the word there is sense, where you sense the transcendental realities. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, if you read uh, Heidegger's work on, on Herdland's poetry, he has another one that's just called... Um, Herdland's hymn, The Ister, and it's again a thin volume, 
there's a lot of discussion. It's a lot of, uh, he uses a lot of terminology that people are like, ooh, that's weird. What does he mean to capitalize the word source? Because he'll capitalize that. But, you know, Heidegger scholars like my advisor, he's an international Heidegger scholar, and Dr. Ian Thompson out of University of New Mexico. Heidegger does that because he does not want to limit how we're understanding it. You know, he wants to preserve the very nature of Aletheia as an infinite thing that, yeah, we can keep uncovering and uncovering and discovering and discovering, but we should never stop and say, oh, we're done now. We, f we, we figured it all out. And that would be the nature of anything that's a transcendental reality. So hopefully that answered your question. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Hamal. I'm also just thinking about the question about the uh, the contradictions, the antinomies, the opposites. Yes. And yes or no, black and white. Yeah. What strikes me about Plato is that, first of all, he never wrote a treatise or right. anything in any way systematic. Mm -hmm. He wrote poetry. He was a dramatist. Yes. You know, we call them dialogues. They are dramas with mm -hmm. specific individuals and so on. And to me, every word he ever wrote is dripping with irony. Yeah. yeah. And you, I don't think we can read Plato or appreciate him without a deep understanding of paradox and irony. Mm -hmm. And both of those, it seems to me, transcend the yes. black and white. Uh, and an, an obvious, to me, and very penetrating example is how often Plato is condemned because he has somewhat of a negative perspective on the arts. Mm -hmm. he, you know, the censorship of poetry and all that. But at the same time, he wrote right. his dialogues with the greatest works of poetry ever written. Which would seem to be a contradiction. Exactly. But, exactly. but I think you, you hit on it when you, when you referenced him more as an as a artist or a poet or an art, you know, an artist of words. Which again, um, Kierkegaard, just because I just taught him the other day, one of the things he talks about is about systematizers, right? Because that's big in existentialism is this sort of critique of the systematic philosophers. And Kierkegaard says these systematizing philosophers, they, they create these giant structures, these systems that are like palaces and they all dwell out back in a shack. <laughs> because they're trying to reduce something down to, in a way that the thing itself, whatever it is, is fundamentally irreducible. So Heidegger, Kierkegaard, Plato, these kind of people, they seek to preserve the infinite nature of the very things they're trying to have a discussion about. Not because they're giving up and going, we're done, we don't know the answer, but more because they're trying to acknowledge the way in which those things are not finite. Yeah, so that was, that was a good point. But yeah, he's, iron, he's definitely ironic, sardonic. You never know when he's being serious. There was one more person right here, yeah. Hi, am I one? Um, yeah. Well, again, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I had sort of two questions about further reading. Um, yeah. First, I guess, is there anything you specifically recommend for a specific topic tonight? And then back more generally, the primary source is a specific question. Do you, have, do you know um, Cohen's big anthology? The, uh, um, yeah. What are you, what's your feelings on that? I can't say that I have read an extensive amount of it. I had one professor at a certain point that, you know, because different professors will kind of pick sure. certain things they, they like, and so I know I had a professor that I had a great deal of respect for who, who certainly favored that. Seems so very popular. Right? Yeah, but again, that kind of ties back into whether something's canonical. You know, and all I mean by that is, you know, is something been what everyone's reading for the last 50 or 100 years? Not that that makes it not good to read, <coughs> but like, you know, insofar as this trend in the last 20, 30 years of philosophy is to sort of say, okay, here's the canon, but let's maybe think about new ways of thinking about these things. As far as further reading, I mean, one of the books that came to me as soon as you said, oh, is there another book, is um, a collection of little essays called Heidegger and the Greeks. And again, I'm just because Heidegger is one of the main figures in my dissertation, but um, it really explores <laughs> like, certain individual concepts or ideas or ideals. Um, mm. I believe that, well, no, but I know that's the, uh, Highland, yes, I do, I'm sorry, Drew Highland. Thank you. Yeah, but that would be a good one. Um, uh, continental, though, like if you were gonna do a search and you type in continental philosophy and then whatever other search terms you're interested in, 
that's going to yield results that are more in keeping with some of the ideas I'm speaking to today. For philosophy people, they know this, but if you don't, there's a big difference between continental thinkers and what's called the analytic tradition, which is more in keeping with modernity. You know, Descartes and Kant, which I love, believe me, but it's, it's a whole different approach to things. Yeah. Yes. Anybody else? I myself uh, did read a lot of Heidegger, and I thought a lot of him. But I don't understand why such an intelligent man <laughs> was a great fan of Hitler, yeah. and never refused to uh, speak down on mm -hmm. Hitler, even after right. all, uh, at the end of World War II, when we found the right. horrible things that Hitler had started. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So why, how come a, 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 an intelligent right. philosopher who is supposed to know so much right. gets on the wrong team? <laughs> <laughs> um, my advisor could probably answer that much more fully because he's currently working on his third book, which is the, you know, the biography of Heidegger and trying to understand that very question. I don't know if you've heard, there's a re recent release of the Black Notebooks which are writings of Heidegger's that have not been released until very recently. Yeah, I can't claim to know exactly the answer. My best understanding is that first of all, Heidegger joined the National Socialist Party purely on one thing, and that was education. He was convinced that the National Socialist Party were gonna reform education and they had promised him the rectorship at Freiburg and he was looking to return education to the Plato style. Now, by no means does that justify him, but I also do know what it's like for someone to be an incredibly genius intellectual in a tower somewhere out of touch with the, with the world. I don't know if that was the case. We do know he spent a tremendous amount of time in his little farmhouse in the Black Forest. He had no electricity. He would go out there and spend months out there writing and again, I'm not trying to excuse him by any means, but you know, that's my own best understanding and what I've gained from talks with my advisor who is like a scholar of Heidegger. Um, why he never copped to anything, and there's a lot of interviews and things like that. Firstly, I, I, I can only come up with, I think he was stubborn. And you know, like a lot of humans, because he's still a human, no matter how brilliant, he just couldn't bear to say that you know, he had done something wrong. Nor, he was never trying to justify himself either. You know, he always tried to like, take the conversation back around to transcendental realities or, or some, you know, something like that instead of addressing those more practical, like on the ground, on the street issues. Um, but I'll, I'll say it to everybody here like I do to any of my students regarding any thinker. Every thinker that I'm familiar with throughout history has a view that somebody, if not all of us, might take issue with today in the way our current consciousness of society is. Aristotle is a misogynist. It's a fact. Aristotle is a sexist, but I love Aristotle. I'm an Aristotelian existentialist. That's how I identify myself. Um, I love virtue ethics. I love Aristotle, but he was a sexist. Um, Kant a neurotic sexist, but Kant is brilliant. So, you know, in logic, which I also teach on occasion, logic and critical thinking, there is um, a fallacy of reasoning called ad hominem. And that is when, when you're trying to evaluate a thinker's thought, instead of evaluating their thinking, you evaluate the person. Because thought, in a certain way, is independent of the person. So just imagine if I was standing up here smoking, but I was making arguments to you about why you shouldn't smoke. Hopefully you see my arguments about why you shouldn't smoke are still rational. Is everybody following me? Even though I'm standing there smoking. Reason is independent, and that, that's from Plato on. And, and so, you know, not that I would ever try to justify Heidegger, I'm not, but I do still believe, like, his thinking is, he's still arguably the, the the most brilliant thinker of the, of the 20th century. 
but you know, did he make some choices and do some things that were like, well, you know, I should. I love to read him, but I wouldn't want to been married to him, you know. But his famous affair, 50 years, love affair was Hannah Arendt, the, the Jewish philosopher. And he helped her tremendously, although they weren't carrying on a physical affair. They carried on a long-distance uh, mental, emotional love affair for one another. And he mentored her, and he helped her achieve great things. And she was a great, you know, uh, benefit to the Jewish community. You know, and, and again, not to just to sort of fill in some of the stuff you're saying. Yeah, it's it's just one of those weird things where you're like, huh. Hopefully, one day we'll we'll understand more. Um, but like any thinker, I would never say, oh, don't read them just because they were a bad person, <laughs> right? A lot of brilliant people do stuff. And Ernest Hemingway, I mean, you know, blew his head off. I mean, you're not going to read his books. Well, of course, you should still read his literature. You know. Anybody else? Sure. Over the last maybe 15 years, we met a man from Sururu. Mm -hmm. They named Sururu from Burundi. And he said, whenever you have a, anything critical to say about someone in, in Burundi, you make up a story. What do you think of that particular system that includes them in it? Uh -huh. but doesn't have, their, not their name, but it's mm -hmm. it, obviously if they're listening, they would understand this is about them. I like it as an idea. I especially like the element of the creativity part because back to what we were discussing about how transcendental realities and transcendental ideas are always best understood through poetry or art or, or myth or a theater play. And so, I mean, I think that that's a beautiful idea. In fact, um, you've now inspired me to go, go home and make up a story about Hiker <laughs> that I can tell my students when they're like, oh my gosh, is this true? You know, because they'll love him when I explain his thought. And then, you know, if they learn about the, when they learn about the biographical stuff, they're, they're horrified, rightly so. Um, but no, that, that was lovely. Anybody else? Now that you're, uh, in the last 10 minutes we've gone to the 20th century, I wanted to do a very, very broad question. It seems that since about, oh, middle 70s, uh, and who knows what to blame, whether it's disillusionment in the West between uh, political things, Watergate, Nixon, you have Vietnam, and you throw, you advance forward to 2015. Uh, it, I think um, on the surface we see uh, an error, at least in the West, of major, especially with young folks, meaning under 50, cynicism and kind of uh, secular kind of head, headset, and I think information obsessed. I was interested in is, what's your take on, if, you were, if we were looking at, if we were in the future describing this era, philosophically, where is the West at today? Well, interestingly it's enough... It's a big question, but I know you with Plato, perhaps. Well... I did want to throw that at you at no, the end of the it, evening. I love it, and okay. it's a great way to just maybe wrap things up, but I'm going to go back to Heidegger on that, because okay. um, one of Heidegger's uh, centrally important ideas that I'm interested in, that everyone is interested in that studies Heidegger, is this um, his critique of technology. And um, he was not anti-technology. He um, called it the danger and the promise. And he was concerned of, uh, it's a, this is a German word, uh, gestell. And it's translated as in framing. And he predicted, as did Nietzsche before him with different vernacular, that what they saw coming was human beings giving over to technology in such a way that technology takes on entityhood and that rather than ask should we do something ought we do it we will do it because we can and thus he saw the technologization of humanity bringing about the potential annihilation of humanity and so you know I teach environmental ethics it's a class I teach every semester and so we talk about all kinds of environmental things and but one of the things that often you know we'll spend an essay or two on is some certain things like the way in which our current reality in this on this planet um, is one in which starvation is a very real 
possibility for a large number of people on this planet because we have destroyed all the soil on this planet. The only truly fertile soil remaining is pretty much in the Amazon. Most soil on which we're growing food is only growing food because we fertilize it, which requires fossil fuels. And, and, and so this is an example just to, you know, uh, of this one way in which we have inframed ourselves. We, we, we sought to mass produce as much as we could because it seemed like the thing to do without having that long-term thinking and asking ourselves, well, we can do it, but ought we to do this? And that's what happens when we're in frame. And so you referenced how we're like obsessed with information. It seems to be. Absolutely. We can have so much information. I've, and I, with my students, I have to, you know, I always encourage them, look, try to start spending some time each day in quiet, solitary reflection. And it's amazing how many of them will admit right up that they are never quiet and alone mm -hmm. because they have technology constantly putting information into them. And, and so that's another way in which we become inframed, according to Heidegger. Um, we, you know, we, we think we know it all because it's, oh, well, here, let me get on my smartphone. Let me Google that, right? But like Plato might tell us, well, try Googling justice and see how far you really get with that, you know, Googling freedom, happiness, peace. Um, but I, I personally, and again, because it was, once I moved to Vermont, um, I started teaching environmental ethics when I came here, and it just wove its way into the things I was already doing. And again, you know, however heinous and horrible a human being Heidegger may, may have been, um, that concept of Gestell is, and his ideas about technology, I find just undeniable. It, you know, in terms of when you think about how long ago he wrote this stuff, he was just kind of seeing when it was starting to come and then where we are in, in 2015 with technology. So hopefully that answered your question to some degree. Yeah. All right. Are we good? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you so much.